in case you don't get the book already, here are some copies. Um, I'm probably only going to bring copies for one more day, unless there's some kind of shortage, um, because I don't want to waste paper. We have in financial accounting, we have the idea of GAAP. And what GAAP says is that there are basic rules that everybody should follow. And that's GAAP stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. So these basic rules, this is how everybody should account for things. Now, where GAAP comes from, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, is a little bit complicated. But the basic idea, it's kind of like having a dictionary. And everybody agrees that these are the words. These are what words mean. And they don't change those definitions. You got one? You need one more? They're right over here. There are extra copies over here. So we all agree that what revenue means is what revenue means, and different expenses mean what they mean, and so on and so forth. So there's no dispute. And this way, when you look at financial statements, and a company says this is revenue or this is cash, you know exactly what they're talking about. So generally accepted accounting principles give you those basic rules that you can follow when you're preparing your financial statements. So the Securities and Exchange Commission, if you haven't heard of the SEC before, um, this is a good time. The Securities and Exchange Commission is the commission of the federal government that regulates um, stocks and bonds. And so the SEC, through the Security Exchange Commission, designates who determines what GAAP is, and it designates that to an organization called the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, right here. Financial Accounting Standards Board. And the Financial Accounting Standards Board is actually a private organization. It's in Connecticut. I think it's in Norwalk or Stamford, Connecticut. And what they do is the Financial Accounting Standards Board basically makes the rules. In fact, there's a big deal today. The Financial Accounting Standards Board just came out with a big new rule on revenue accounting. And um, this accountants are all excited because it's probably the biggest rule, new rule to come out in several years. Um, and it just happened today. So Financial Accounting Standards Board makes the rules. It's a private organization. And everyone pretty much agrees to follow the FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board, to follow the FASB's rule. Now, when you read a set of financial statements, follow the scenario of how financial statements are prepared. Financial statements are prepared by the company. This is something like if you were to write your own report card. So we asked you at the end of the semester, how did you do? And that's what um, financial statements are like. Because companies report to you their performance on their own. They say to you, this was our profit. Well, how do you know they're telling you the truth? Because it would be very tempting if I was president of a company, you wanted to invest in my company, and also the board determines my salary. I mean, it'd be very tempting for me as the president of the company to kind of inflate things a little and exaggerate and find ways to increase revenue and increase profits that aren't necessarily real. So there needs to be some kind of check on companies so when they report their financial statements that the financial statements are accurate. And that's called the audit. Now, an audit isn't just something by the IRS. An audit is something it's called an independent audit. And it's performed on a company's financial statements to verify that they really are what they say they are. So when the company says it has a million dollars in revenue, the audit verifies that, in fact, they really have a million dollars in revenue. And audits are the special job of certified public accountants. So I'm sure everybody's heard of the expression certified public accountants. And you may have wondered, what is a certified public accountant? Well, a certified public accountant is someone who's qualified to do an audit of financial statements. Um, they're licensed by the state, and that's what they're licensed to do. It's very interesting. Technically, CPAs are not audited, are not trained or certified to um, do tax returns. People don't know that. Or to provide first personal financial planning and all these other things. Now, part of a CPA's training is to learn something about taxes, but it's approximately, I'd say, like 10 or 15% of their total training. 
So when you go to a CPA to do your taxes, because that's the gold standard, of course, they actually don't have a lot of training in how to do taxes. So most CPAs who do taxes, they get a lot more training so they know what they're doing. When you go to a CPA, presumably you're going to someone who knows what they're doing and they've had the training that they need. But someone who's right out of college, like out of Seton Hall, let's say, and they get their accounting degree and they get certified as a certified public accountant, they really don't have a lot of training to do taxes, believe it or not. CPAs are mainly to audit financial statements to ensure that they're compliant with GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. Now, CPAs have a code of ethical behavior. This is written by the AICPA, American Institute of CPAs. It's an important organization. This is basically the national or the national organization for accountants in the United States. There's another organization, it's actually a government entity called the PCAOB, and it's kind of nicknamed, accountants nickname it the Peekaboo, PCAOB. And what PCAOB does is it verify, it, it inspects the auditors. So auditors check the financial statements, but who's going to audit the auditors to make sure they're following all the rules? That they're auditing the way you're supposed to audit, that they're doing all the individual, they're meeting all the requirements of the federal government and the AICPA. And this is the job of Peekaboo. Peekaboo inspects public audits and inspects the public audit firms to ensure that they're following the rules. Yeah, David? Um, the Peekaboo, is this just um, the United States um, supervision of the auditor? Or is there like an international thing that's like centered around like there's no international regulation of auditors. None whatsoever. It's done on a national basis. In the United States it's done by Peekaboo. In other countries it may be done by whoever their organizations are. And in fact, Peekaboo is new. There previously was no federal government oversight of the audit profession until two thousand one. So this is completely no new. Until two thousand one Auditors were just trusted, and then after the Enron disaster, um, companies decided, the federal government decided to get involved, and it created Peekaboo, which now audits the auditors. Good question. What's the, what's the admittance to Peekaboo? No, you just knew about an incident before. The Enron incident. If you remember Enron about 14 years ago, um, their financial statements were just completely fraudulent. And the accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, had signed off for them as in accordance with GAAP, whereas in fact they were not in accordance with GAAP. And um, it led to what could have been a major market slide or crash. Um, the company itself, I mean, the company just overnight one day it said at the bottom of a press release, oh, and by the way, we lost, we're writing off $2 billion worth of assets this quarter. And everyone's like, huh? <laughs> Why are you writing off? Where'd that come from? <laughs> Except for that, we would have been profitable, <laughs> you know? But we're writing off $2 billion worth of assets. So a few people noticed that, and they're like, well, why? Where did they go? Where did, what do you do with $2 billion worth of assets? And so when they investigated a little further, they realized that there was a lot of fraudulent activity, and most of the profits that Enron was reporting were completely fraudulent. They didn't exist. So the next question was, well, Arthur Anderson, signed off that these financial statements are accurate and they're in accordance with GAAP. What were they doing? So they investigated the audit and they discovered that there were a lot of things that Arthur Anderson should have been doing that they weren't doing. And there were certain things that Anderson was doing that they should not have been doing. Um, and so from there, the federal government decided to get involved and instituted new rules for auditors. And that's where Peekaboo comes from. Um, okay, take a second right now and answer these first three questions, and then we'll go over them. <laughs> Which are the rules that must be followed when preparing financial statements for external use? GAAP. Excellent. GAAP stands for? Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. Who conducts audits that attest to whether a company's financial statements comply with GAAP? 
CPAs. Excellent. You all got 100. This is going to be a good summer. Now, there's the idea of historical cost principle. It's an extremely important principle and gap. The basic idea is that we want to report assets and other values in the financial statements at something that's verifiable. So, for example, if you ask me how much my house is worth, right, I could give you, I could tell you how much it's worth on the market today. And I think in my ha mind, like about different houses that went on the market in my neighborhood. And let's say there's one house down the block and it went for 400000 There's another one went for 420000 There's another one that went for 390000 So you ask me, what's your house worth? I would say, well, it's worth somewhere between three hundred ninety and 420000 And like, you don't know about, you know, the fact that what kind of, you know, I don't have to tell you what bad condition my house is. It's not worth as much as the other one. But I'm going to just approximate what it's worth. Now, if I bought in a real estate agent, say, how much is this house worth? They might give me a different number. And I bought another real estate agent, they're going to give me another number. The truth is, I don't know what it's worth. It's worth something, but that number would be very hard to determine. On the other hand, if you ask me how much money I paid for my house, I could give you an exact figure, and no one can argue with it. Okay, I paid X now, let's say, $250,000 for my house. I paid $250,000 for my house. That's what I paid. And it's not open to debate. So when you're looking at financial statements, what kind of numbers would you rather see? Would you rather see solid numbers that are not open to debate? Or would you like to see numbers that they are kind of iffy? They're, they require some estimates. What would you rather see? You'd rather see solid number. Wait a second now. How relevant is it how much I paid for my house 12 years ago? Not really relevant because the value of my house has changed. You would really want to know what's the value of my house today. What will I tell you? I don't know. So you got to make it a trade-off there. Are you going to go with the numbers that are solid but a little old? Or are you going to go with numbers that are open to some judgment and subjectivity that are new and that are more current? And what the FASB says usually is they like to go with information that's what they call verifiable and reliable. So verifiable and reliable is historical cost. How much did you pay? And it's not necessarily the current value of something. So when you put inventory, let's say that I paid 80 cents for this bottle of soda and then I sell it for $1.49. What's the value that should go on my balance sheet? I'm going to put it on at historical cost, 80 cents, because that's the amount of money that I paid. Everyone would agree that that is the value of it. And in general, in accounting, when it comes to inventory, and especially long-term assets like buildings, equipment, land, um, vehicles, things like that. I always put them on at historical cost. Okay, take a second. Questions four, five, and six. All right, let's go. An auto has a sticker price. Sticker price is twenty thousand. The company purchases the auto and negotiates the price down to eighteen thousand. What number is going to be reported on the balance sheet for this auto? Eighteen thousand or twenty thousand? 18,000 because everybody knows the sticker price isn't really doesn't mean anything. The real number is how much you paid for it. 30 years ago you bought land for 2,000. Currently the market value is 100,000. I wrote this example here. On the balance sheet, what will be reported for what value will be reported for the land? 100,000. How many say 2,000? How many say 100,000? It's 2,000. That's the historical cost. Now, what number do you really want to see? You'd like to know the current value. But the problem, what's the problem with $100,000? Who knows if it's $100,000? Right? Current market value, $100,000. I bring another real estate agent, they're going to tell me worth it's $200,000 or $75,000. Someone will say, you know what? I know the person who is next door, and they will pay a premium for this piece of land. They're willing to pay $500,000 for this piece of land. Does that make it worth 500000 It's all hypotheticals. 
2000 is rock solid. Everybody can agree on it. It's reliable. It's verifiable. So that's what we go with, historical cost. Financial statements are prepared according to GAAP. Assets and services are reported at their acquisition costs or current market value. Acquisition costs. Think about it. Is knowledge of an asset's current market value ever useful? Yeah. Absolutely. When? Huh. When you're trying to sell it? When else? I'm going to write here when you're trying to estimate the real value of the company. Right? If you want to know what's the stock worth, then you want to know what what the market value of the assets is. The value of the land 50 years ago, who cares? 30 years ago. All right, one last thing here. And that's IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. There's a separate, in the U.S., we use what we call U.S. GAAP. That's American generally accepted accounting principles in the United States. Now, in the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world today, they use a system called IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. IFRS is not the same as U.S. GAAP. So what this means is that companies that report financial statements in Europe and around the world usually use IFRS or they use a local accounting system. If you were to compare a U.S. company, let's say Nike, with a foreign company, a European company, let's say Adidas. Adidas is centered in Germany in the EU. Adidas uses IFRS and Nike uses the United States. If you were to compare the two companies side by side, you would have a problem because they use different rules. Um, there's some changes being made. And for example, the new rule that came out today is the same for the US as it is for IFRS. So they, as they come out with new rules, they're trying to come out with new rules so that US GAAP will be the same as IFRS eventually. Um, they were originally planning that they would be identical by like 2010. And um, they just quit halfway through the project. And so now the project's going very slowly. So let's just answer this last question. Are there differences among the accounting standards of different countries? Yes, are, there are or there are not. There are differences. Circle that. IFRS are global accounting standards that U.S. GAAP is converging toward or is in full compliance with. Converging toward, and the specific term that they use is convergence. Eventually, they want the two sets of standards to be the same, but currently they are not the same.